While writing user stories is not a new concept in this series, this nugget will focus on the details of how we write good stories. So first we'll start with a definition of what is a user story. We'll provide a little more definition of what is done. And then we'll get into the real meat of this nugget is what are the characteristics of a good story? How do we know it's a good story? And how do we know we've had enough grooming on that story and that it is a good story? And there are more than one type of story. We've already discussed that we have business stories and team stories. We'll provide a little more clarification, a little more detail on the various types of stories. And with various types of stories done, we will then go in and talk about the various examples of what a good story looks like, recognizing that the format and style of stories will vary a little bit depending upon the type of the story. And finally, we'll introduce this new concept called a stereotype. And a stereotype is a template or a sample of good stories of the various types that the team can use and draw from and model off of. And finally, I'm going to say, don't forget about the back of the card. We have the what is done and a concept on the back of the card that I haven't talked about yet is use the back of the card to write notes. And we start off with the same user story model that we used back in the artifacts with the recommendation that a user story is printed on a plain index card, the three and a half by five or whatever size that you use. Not critical. You can use software. There is lots of good software out there that you can use for doing your user story definition. The beauty of the software, of course, is it's electronic and it's quote unquote easier to change. But Steve believe it's also very easy to change this one because you simply pick it up and you cross that out and you make your new adjustments. Or if the adjustments are very significant, you take it, you rip it up and you start over again. So yes, software has the benefits that it's easy to change easy to reprint and easy to post, but it's also very easy to change in this format. So again, there is no hard or fast rule that the user story has to be the index card, but a lot of people find that the index card or some very manual process works. Steve also suggested that maybe you want to use different colors for the types of stories, i.e. user stories versus epics. And this is just a very quick visual clue that says everything that's in white, for example, is a detailed story. And everything that's in yellow is a epic. Just that visual alert that there is going to be a lot more detail coming from all of the cards with yellow. So when this, the backlog is getting down to a very manageable number, but that very manageable number is also yellow, expect that you're going to have a story time, that you're going to have a grooming session very soon that's going to take and break all of those yellows down into a much, much larger number of whites. Now, the basic premise of a user story is, as a specific type of user, I need to do something, this is the what, so that a result is achieved. This is the why. And using a combination of these, this should help the team understand the need. And as discussed many times in the series already, we want this what and this how to the point that no more than a 10 minute conversation is needed to fully flesh out to fully answer all of the details. Now, do we absolutely have to follow this method, this model? As a user, I need to so that? Absolutely not. Some people prefer to make their, their user stories more goal focused. In order to achieve a result as a type of user, I want to. It's exactly the same information. We've just reordered it so that we put this first, this second, and this third. The beauty of it is you get the result up front. 
you bury the user, which is probably the least relevant piece of information in the story card, and you put the actions that the team member needs to do last. So it just pulls out the two most important pieces and bookcases the least important piece in the middle. Or maybe you want to create it as a value focused. In order to create some value as a type of user, I want to do something. So again, the format, the model, the style of the user, user story, the user card, is really irrelevant. And you may find that different users, different SMEs, will actually develop their own flavor of these, and that's fine. Scrum is all about being not rigid. Scrum is all about being flexible and nimble. So I am absolutely not going to enforce that my user stories must follow this absolute exact format and style. I will let my SMEs have a great deal of, of their own discretion, but I will insist that the same information, I need to know who, I need to know what, and I need to know why. And I would prefer, not quite insist, but I would prefer that it's in bullet style. I am very much a proponent of bullet style. Bullets are shorter, they're more succinct, they're typically clearer, and they will absolutely do a better job of I need to do sentence fragment bullet as opposed to when I am doing my job as a warehouse clerk, what I really like to be able to do is wander around the warehouse and see, and I deliberately put a lot of fluff words into that sentence, but we can all very much appreciate that as we begin to write sentences, our sentences will become more complex, our sentences will become more elaborate, and our sentences will become full of lots of filler words. So. Focus on getting good, effective user stories put together. We'll talk about the definition of done in just a few moments, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. And over time, through grooming sessions, we will add the business value and the priority. Often when the story is written, we want to make a first cut at the business value, but it will evolve with grooming like all of the other aspects of the, the user story, and the priority typically doesn't get set until later. And while the definition of the as a type of user I need to so that is critical for rating a good user story, I humbly believe that what is done is even more critical because what is done is going to determine our pass or fail. This is going to be our measurement. And I believe measurement is key. And in order for our pass or fail to be truly 100%, and I'll come back to 100% in just a moment, but in order for our pass or fail to be truly 100%, the what is done is written after the story is complete. So there is no more grooming. The I need to do so that is 100%. No more than 10 minutes. Conversation. We do the what is done afterwards because we want it to be 100% complete. And why do we want it to be 100% complete? Because we want to have success guaranteed. I.e., when we present what is done, when we do the show and tell, there will be no doubts. The team has achieved what it is that the user story expects, and the team has proven that what is done is done. So significant attention needs to be paid 
to the pass or fail. This story is complete and we don't need to put those words on the user story because that's implied but this story is complete when status clearly indicates stock on hand when stock is on hand status clearly indicates stock not on hand when stock is not available and so on and so on so these are literally the actual test criteria with these test criteria clearly laid out in addition to all of the standard what is done the peer reviews the etc cetera, etc cetera, that we discussed in an earlier nugget the team as part of working on the story this is when the story is in play this is not a grooming activity this is an activity the team member does as part of working on the story the team member will take all of those pass fail criteria and translate that into test cases so find an item in stock select it validate the green tick box find an item not in stock select it validate the red X ideally we want as many of these test cases written in a format that they can be put into our automated tool so that we can put it into our build and we can do the automated testing every test every pass fail does not need to be built into the automated testing tool but we would like to have as many tests as possible and the most critical tests for each story automated into our build server so that as we do our daily builds we have 100 percent confidence that no regression functionality has been broken through a successive build so with all of that laid out the characteristics of a good story stories should be self-sufficient i.e. we can pick up a story and write it and test it and complete it with no other dependencies on other other any other stories now we've already expressed that there will be issues when we need to do database tuning when we need to have data input before the story can be completed i.e. the inventory validation sample we just used where we will validate that the inventory is in stock and there's a green or check marks or a red X obviously the data input before the story is needed that doesn't override the concept of self-sufficiency the story can be written the story to validate the inventory the story to give us the green tick box and the red X is self-sufficient 100 percent completion of the testing may be dependent upon getting the data into the database but the story itself is self-sufficient we don't want to have stories that log naturally flow naturally from one to the other and literally that it takes six stories to truly complete a business function that is not a good story we need to focus on breaking our stories down so that we can pick up a story we can write it we can test it and we complete it as a single point and each story needs to deliver business value again with the expectation that we understand some stories are going to be team stories that are there purely to make the project work i.e. the chores and chores will deliver value to the business in the viewpoint of it that they're critical for architecture for infrastructure 
So they are inherently providing business value, but not providing direct business value. But the majority of all of our stories need to be self-sufficient and deliver business value. And those are our two key characteristics. Next, they need to be estimatable. There needs to be enough detail so that when we go into our estimating game and the product owner reads off, I as type of user need to do a function so that I can deliver value, the team needs to be able to understand that definition of the story and say, this is four story points, this is eight story points, this is 16 story points, and so on. And as we discussed in our estimating module, we need to be small. When we're looking at our series, the 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, we don't want to have stories that are running into those upper ranges. I would suggest a 16 story point story is absolutely at the threshold. And I would encourage most product owners, SMEs, if I find a story that is in the 16 range, that is there any way we can break that down? I like to keep my stories in the very small, but I will accept the fact that I will let some stories that are just absolutely core business functionality that just are very complex calculations or very complex business logic that has to have that much complexity to maintain the overriding concepts of self-sufficiency. Sure, I'll let those go through, but I will try to keep them small. And as just discussed in what is done, they have to be testable. We have to have confidence that done is done. There's no subjectivity. There's no, well, <clears throat> I guess it's okay. They have to be verifiable. And as we just discussed, ideally, we want to have it with automated testing that we can build it into our daily build server and do ongoing regression validation of the build. And probably the key, and it's been discussed about 100 times already in this Nugget series, every story will deliver minimum functionality. Make it work is the first goal of every story. Once we make it work with minimum functionality, we then make it fast. We make it better. And that is in a second or third or fourth story where we embellish. And I don't really like the word embellish, but it seems appropriate where we add the non-minimal functionality and rarely do we make it pretty. where Steve associates making it pretty with adding the bells and the whistles that are rarely, if ever, needed. Some business users sitting there somewhere and saying, you know, once a year, I get a request from a customer to do that. Let's embellish the story to add the functionality to do that once a year question from the customer. We need to push back and say, if it only happens once a year, can you deal with it any other way than with code? Can you deal with it manually? Oh, absolutely. I can keep a, a, a Rolodex in my desk to do it. Okay, then let's do it. Minimal functionality. First goal is to make it work with the least amount of effort. And often when we make it work with the least amount of effort, that's all that's needed. We're done. There will be no second, third, and fourth stories, but sometimes making it work with the least amount of effort, we need to make it faster. We need to make it better. And faster can be in two senses. Faster can be in the technology sense that it's just inefficient. We used an example earlier in this series of an inefficient search algorithm. The first search algorithm worked but we found that the response time was not as fast as we wanted, so we needed to make it faster. So faster can be from a technology viewpoint or faster can be from a business viewpoint. Making it work required them to use three screens or four extra keystrokes or two extra mouse clicks to get the job done. 
they would like to create a streamline, they would like to create a shortcut key, they would like to amalgamate the data from three screens into one core screen. So faster can be both from a technology sense or a business sense. And more times than not, after we make it faster and better, with the additional story two or three, we never go farther because often we never make it pretty. So we've already discussed types of stories. We've talked about business stories. We've talked about team stories. And we've talked about technology stories. I would take, like to take those business stories and break them down into three subcategories. We have business stories that are going to be coding stories. And this is the where the majority of all stories are going to be classified. I, as a type of user, need to do something so that I deliver value. Those are the stories that are going to result in our team writing code. But there are going to be business stories that are analysis stories. We need to better understand something. So often there will be analysis stories Go and interview five warehouse staff to determine the preferred method for doing something. Remembering that in a Scrum project, no work gets done unless there's a story. So if we need to go out and interview the warehouse staff to determine the best way of doing something, we need a story to do that, and we generically call that an analysis story. Or we need to do some experimentation. We know we need to do a search. We can do a search using search method one, two, or three. So in an exploratory story, we're going to write some code. We're going to validate slash experiment, and then we're going to throw it away. These are what are called exploratory stories. And as we discuss some agile terms and techniques later, this is often called a spike, where we write some exploratory code to do some experimentation, and then we throw it away. The difference between an analysis story and an exploratory story, analysis is typically a human discussion, research, etc. But it's all human based where an exploratory story is typically throwaway code based. We've already discussed at length team stories where the team needs work for the build server, etc. etc. The team needs training. We've already talked about technology stories where we need to do a database reorg. And we certainly have talked about epics. So recognizing that there are multiple types of stories, there's going to be multiple formats of writing these stories. And to help drive home that concept that different stories will follow different models, here are some examples. Here's the one we talked about all along. As a type of user, as a warehouse clerk, I need to do something. I need to validate the inventory so that I can confirm a shipment. As a forklift driver, I need to know where a part is stored so that I can retrieve it. That is the business user code stories. Here is an analysis story. Investigate picking methods so that we can improve efficiency. This is where we're going to go out and interview the warehouse staff. Implement a new build server. This is the team or a technology story. Prototype three search approaches for finding part numbers. This is our exploratory. And you'll notice they're quite different. These follow the prescribed format. As a type of user, I need to do something so that I deliver value. And this is where the majority. 
So we need to focus on getting our format and style and our tone for these right. These others, I'm going to say are more free format. They're not going to have a what is done. More times than not, these are not estimated. These are time boxed, as already discussed. Investigate picking methods so that we can improve efficiency. That could take two hours, two weeks, or two months. We could bring in a university expert to do motion studies to understand picking methods probably not where we want to be with a scrum project is bringing in a university expert a, a motion and flow expert and spending two months but we may want to spend two hours of the team going out and talking to the warehouse people to investigate better picking methods time box it implement a new build server the team has 16 hours to do that work so we would decrease the number of story points in this particular sprint by 16 hours to ensure the team has time to do that. And prototype three search approaches. Again, time box it. Let's spend about three hours per search approach. So that's nine hours. And let's spend another two hours validating which one is most effective. So three hours per plus two hours for summarize. So the format, the style, and even the estimating method for these non-code-based stories will be very different. And here's that new term I introduced you to in the introduction, stereotypes. These are templates, models, samples, kickstarts, Pick the word that works for your project. Basically, they're samples of good projects. What is a sample of a good analysis story? Let's take three or four of those and create three or four analysis stereotypes, post them, and make them available to the team. Don't post them on the product backlog. We're not going to want to develop these stereotypes, but post them for reuse. Same thing goes. If we have models of terrific coding stories so that we can hand these coding stories to the SMEs, we can hand these coding stories to the product owner and say this is what a good story looks like for coding, for business needs. Here's a good example for, for an exploratory story type. And often we're going to create templates, recognizing that we're going to do this handwritten on cards, but the teammates, the SMEs, will still take those templates and use it as a model. This is what I should create a good story based on. It's just a faster way to start. And if any of you have taken my traditional project management training, you'll know Steve hates the blank piece of paper. In this case, the blank index card. If I have any way, even if I pick up a blank index card and have words that I know I'm going to transcribe onto that black blank index card to get me started, it's the faster way to get started. It's time efficient. And it adds for consistency. So not a lot of time required to create some good stereotypes for your project, but something well worth exploring. And finally, don't forget the back of the card. We've already spent a lot of time talking about what goes on the front of the card. I don't think we need to spend any more time on that. But there's another side to that index card. We've already discussed what we're going to do with the bottom part of the card. We're going to put all of our tick boxes for the definition of done. The peer review of the analysis has been done. The peer review of the design has been done. The test cases have been created. The test cases have been peer reviewed. And I would expect my product owner to look at every card during show and tell and visually validate that each and every tick box has been completed. It's just good best practice. But that still leaves us a significant amount of the back of the card that's for the team's usage. 
as the team has that 10-minute conversation. The team shouldn't take a separate notepad with them and write copious notes because that notepad is going to get lost, that notepad is going to get misplaced, that notepad is going to become obsolete. If we write all of our notes, all of our comments, all of our clarifications, anything else on the back of that card, it's preserved with the story. This is one single piece of artifact that is going to be taken and moved from the backlog to the sprint backlog to the done board. So all of these notes, all of these clarifications, all of these comments are there for the life of the story, for the life of the project. So in three months time, and we have a story to improve, make faster, story number 14, in all likelihood, as we're doing the improvement, the team should go back to the done board, pull off story 14, have a look at the original intent of story 14, and more importantly, have a look at the notes, the warnings, the concerns, the clarifications on the back of the card, and use that to further refine their understanding of what the improvements are required. Don't forget the back. It's some valuable real estate, and just like we're focused on making this work on a three and a half by five for the writing of the story, I think making it work on a three and a half by five is just important on the back so that we're not writing copious notes, that we're not taking details because this all has to happen in a 10 minute conversation. And you should be able to write all of your notes, probably with small print, but write all of your notes on the back of this index card to make the story 100% complete. This nugget provides that last level of detail for writing good user stories. We reviewed what the user card is. It's the three and a half by five index card. We have the definition of the story as a type of user, I need to do something so that I deliver value. We have the definition of done. We have the business value and the priority. We spent considerable time defining what is done, that it needs to be testable, it needs to be measurable, and preferably it needs to be automated. We talked about the characteristics of a good story. It needs to be small. It needs to be self-contained. It needs to be estimatable. And it needs to have minimal value. Just enough to get the job done. We talked about types of stories. We have business stories, we have team stories, we have technology stories, we have analysis stories, we have coding stories, we have exploratory stories, and then we have the other stories, the team, the technology, etc., etc. We provided a few examples of stories to help drive home the differences between these types of stories. We introduced the concept that let's have some samples, let's have some models, let's not start from a blank, blank card, let's always have something to build from, and finally Steve recommends that you don't forget the back of the card, you write your notes, you write your clarifications, you write anything else that the team member gathers during the work on the story so that we preserve it for future consideration as we're writing the next level of detail for the story in three, four, five, fifteen sprints time. This concludes our nugget on writing user stories. I hope this module has been informative for you and thank you very much for viewing.